Good afternoon, friends. On behalf of the Christian Science Church Gosford, I extend a warm and loving welcome to each and every one of you here today. We have come to hear Julie Ward present a talk titled Cherishing Our Children, A Spiritual Perspective. In this talk, Julie will explore basic points about praying for children, which will be helpful for parents, grandparents, teachers, and all of us who love and support children. Julie was classically trained in ballet, and she could not imagine anything she loved more. However, she has found something she loves more, and that is healing. Dancing had taught her to value discipline, obedience, and persistence, foundational qualities for the practice of Christian science. Friends and family began asking Julie to pray for her, and so her healing practice was born. Julie is now a full-time practitioner and teacher of Christian Science Healing. She is a member of the Christian Science Board of Lectureship and travels from her home in Atlanta, Georgia. Friends, please join with me in a very warm welcome for Julie Ward. Thanks so much, Margaret. And welcome, one and all. We're going to have a wonderful time today. Feel, feel free if you need to stand up and stretch. Go back and get a cup of coffee or a biscuit. We're just going to have a kitchen table talk about children today. I was in my 20s. I was sitting at lunch with one of those wonderful, radiant women who just glowed with her love of life. She was chattering on about her kids, who were backpacking across America that summer. And she was telling me about how she prayed for them each day, knowing that they could never be outside of the presence of God, and that they would always feel his protection, his guidance, his power. I was thinking that they were probably about my age, maybe college students. So you can imagine my surprise when she paused and said, I don't know why I call them the kids. They're 67 and 69. <laughs> At that moment, I thought it was a wildly funny comment. But then, I had children of my own. And I began to understand exactly what she meant. You never stop praying for them. You never stop wanting everything that's good and glorious for them. They never stop growing. And neither do you. To me, this is just a hint of what we mean when we speak of God as both Father and Mother. Our Father Mother. It's that limitless love that never wears out. It's that absolute benevolence that always cherishes and supports and encourages everything that's good and pure and progressive in their lives. You know, this is the love that we all reflect, whether we find ourselves in parental roles or not. So let's think for just a few minutes about the nature of that love. First, envision, if you will, a perfect father. Now think about some of the qualities of thought that a perfect father might include. Qualities like wisdom, or strength. What else? Pollution. Pardon me? Pollution. Yes. What else? Tolerance. Tolerance. I haven't had that one before. That's a good one. What else? Patience. Patience. I always think humor. My dad was very funny. What else? Love. Love. Gentleness. Now, turn that into verbs. For instance, if I were to say to you, a perfect father provides. 
A perfect father protects. What else does a perfect father do? Helps. Helps. Teach. Teaches. Supports. Supports. Disciplines sometimes. Now flip that around. And let's talk about the qualities of thought that a perfect mother embodies. Qualities like gentleness. What else? Nurture. Nurture. Tenderness. Tenderness. Patience. Patience. Comfort. Oh, comfort. That's wonderful. Now let's do the verb thing. What does a perfect mother do? A perfect mother disciplines, nurtures, what else? Tolerates. <laughs> I think we've got a theme going here. <laughs> Tolerates. Educates. Educates. Oops. Comforts, cooks, that's a good one. <laughs> and listens. Listens. Long suffering. Yes, yes. Always long suffering. <laughs> my mom lives with us, and I practice my lectures to my mother. And every time I say to them, what does a perfect mother do? She says, a perfect mother prays. <laughs> you can see that it's not a matter of here are the father qualities and here are the mother qualities. They're all intertwined, aren't they? And the perfect parent or teacher or coach or Sunday school teacher is one in whom all of these qualities intertwine in perfect balance and harmony, and each supports the other. It, it has nothing to do with gender. It has everything to do with oneness. And God is one. God is one perfect, infinite, indivisible good. And that's why in Christian science we refer to God as Father, Mother, God. Our Father. Our Mother. Now I'll bet most of you are familiar with the Lord's Prayer. And that's the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when they asked, Lord, teach us to pray. Who knows the first line of that prayer? <laughs> Hit it, boys. Our Father, which art in, in heaven. In her primary work, Science and Health was key to the scriptures. Mary Baker Eddy renders that line, Our Father, Mother, God, all harmonies. That our is all inclusive. It has nothing to do with age, or gender, or theology, or geography. It's our Father providing, protecting, encouraging. It's our <coughs> Mother cherishing, supporting, comforting, cooking. <laughs> our Father, Mother, God, infinite, indivisible good. All harmonies. Everything fits. Everything's in tune. There are no opposing elements. Our Father, Mother, God, all harmonies. Now I want you to remember that, because it's going to go like a golden thread through the whole talk. Everything we're talking about today is going to go right back to that perfect, indivisible Father, Mother, God. Now, that line came into very sharp focus in my thought back in the early 80s when our newly formed church was having a problem finding enough people to teach Sunday school. We actually had a lot of children, but we didn't have enough adults to care for them in the children's room and, and to teach the Sunday school classes. So the board of our church made a very special request of every single member of the church, and it was this, that each one of us commit to five minutes a day in prayer for the children of the world. That prayer has awakened us and enriched us and changed our lives in ways that we would never have guessed. 
one of my friends, her name was Mary Kay, had a special love for these prayers, and she was absolutely consecrated in her prayers for children. She never missed. And later on, after her husband had passed on and her adult children had moved out of the house, these prayers for the children of the world led her to open her modest country home for children in need. She became a foster mother for children in her rural Georgia county. And many children, over 300, passed through her home in the years that she served as a foster mother. Many of these kids had been abused or neglected. They needed special love. And she told me that when a child came into her home, the very first thing that she taught them was the first line of a little poem that was written by Mary Baker Eddy as a gift for little children. And it starts out, Father, Mother, God, loving me. That's what they learned on their first night in her home. And after that, they learned the rest of the poem. Father, Mother, God, loving me. Guard me when I sleep. Guide my little feet up to thee. After that, they began to learn the 91st Psalm, which begins, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You see, she was teaching them about their real parenthood and about their real home. The first little boy who came into her home was a little toddler named Darren. And during the first year that Darren lived with Mary Kay, he was healed of a leg deformity. And after that, he was adopted into a very stable and happy home. My husband and I had been praying about having children, and it was Darren who inspired us to begin thinking about adoption. As we prayed, these two books were always in our hands, the Bible and its companion book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. As we read the Bible, we read about little Moses. Remember the story of baby Moses? And he was just a little babe in a basket in the reeds by the river's edge. Who would have thought that he would be the one to lead the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt? Who would have thought that he would be the one to receive the Ten Commandments? But God knew. God knew his specific holy purpose. And God put him right where he needed to be to be prepared to fulfill that holy purpose. I thought about little Moses later when I read in Science and Health, Spirit God gathers unformed thoughts into their proper channels and unfolds these thoughts. Even as he opens the petals of a holy purpose in order that the purpose may appear. I knew in my heart that this child that we were cherishing had his own specific holy purpose and that God would reveal that purpose and bring it to fruition. The petals were open and the petals were open so that we could see that holy purpose so that he would be prepared to do just what he needed to do to serve God. And you know, every child, every child of God, including you and me, has his or her own specific, unique, holy purpose. Each one is special. Each one is needed. Each one is holy. The Bible says, God setteth the solitary in families. God is infinite principle. And the nature of principle is to relate its ideas together intelligently. So God brings together those who will bless and support and encourage and uplift each other. And these 
families can come in many surprising forms. They may or may not coincide with the traditional biological sense of family. No one knew this better than Christ Jesus. One day, when the disciples were coming to tell Jesus that his mother and brothers were waiting to see him, Jesus asked a very surprising question. He said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And then pointing to the disciples, he said that his mother and brother and sisters were they who do the will of God. Now, you might be sitting here thinking, I'm not sure why I'm at this lecture. I don't have any children. Or maybe my children are all grown up. I haven't seen them in years. Remember what Jesus said. Who are your sisters, your brothers, your father, your mother? It is they who do the will of God. So you might be a brother, a father, a brother, a sister to a child that you have never even met yet. And why is that? Because you do the will of God. You love. The Bible is filled with many examples of parents who prayed for their children. Think about Hannah, Sarah, and Abraham, the Shunammite woman. These were not helicopter parents hovering over their children's every move, trying to manage their lives. They had to put God first in their own lives. And when they did, it was the most natural thing in the world to trust their children's lives completely to God. Our Father, Mother, God. All harmonious. Remember that one? Have you ever thought about what it might be like to have been Mary and Joseph? They must have had such a sacred, holy sense of what it meant to be entrusted with this unique and special child. What can we learn from Mary and Joseph about the most pure sense of parenting? Well, first, they had to put away the preconceived sense of what it meant to be a parent. Next, they had to be humble and obedient. They had to listen to angels. And they had to be obedient to those angel messages, even when they didn't make a whole lot of sense to the traditional way of viewing life. For instance, when Mary was told by an angel that she would be the mother of Jesus, she very naturally asked, how should these things be? Seeing I know not a man. The angel's answer speaks to the heart of every parent. The angel said, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. The Holy Ghost, the spirit of truth and love, comes upon us. And the power of the highest completely overshadows our personal sense of parenthood with all of its fears and its doubts and its inadequacies. We realize that the child is God's creation and not our own. And we trust God to uplift and protect and support his own idea. We acknowledge God is the only creator and as we do, we become not creators, but grateful witnesses to that creation with all of its beauty and its light and its joy. We can have our hearts just well up with appreciation as Mary's did when she said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Can you see the complete surrender of human pride and human opinion in that response. And you know, there's something else I love to think about when I think about Mary and Joseph. They didn't 
just wish that their boy would be more like the other kids. They weren't trying to put him into a mold, were they? They, they cherished his unique mission. And they furnished a wonderful atmosphere in which it could flourish and be safe. And there's something else. Mary and Joseph were willing to learn from their child. Are we willing to learn from our children? Well, my husband and I have learned so much from our two children. And by the way, we did adopt them both from Korea. And after that, Another couple in our church adopted two little girls from Korea. And then another couple in our church adopted a girl and a boy from India. And then another couple adopted a little girl from Russia. And then another couple joined the church who had three little girls from Russia. And now we have a little girl from China in our Sunday school. We like to think that we have been literally obedient to that biblical command that says, Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. <laughs> but, you know, it's been so much more than just having these lovely children coming into our Sunday school. So much more. Because this prayer for the children of the world has caused us one and all to acknowledge and honor the childlike qualities of meekness and humility and innocence and receptivity wherever we see them. From the children that we see in the shopping mall, to the children in the Sunday school, maybe to the children that we just know about through the news media. We're loving, supporting, protecting those qualities. And you know what happens from that? You begin to acknowledge those qualities in your own heart. You begin to acknowledge the qualities of purity, innocence, spontaneity, buoyancy, they have no expiration date. Mary Baker Eddy, who is the author of Science and Health and the founder of the Christian Science Church, had a deep, abiding love for all children. And she healed many children. My favorite of those healings took place on July 4th, 1897. And I want to tell you a little bit about it. On that date, Mrs. Eddy had invited a large number of her students and her church members to come out to her home in Concord, New Hampshire. And there were a lot of people who traveled to that gathering. Among them, there was a young mother who had a little boy and a little girl aged seven and nine. Now, the little girl had developed a large boil on the top of her head, and she was very uncomfortable. She couldn't even wear the little special hat that had been bought for the occasion. But the mother decided she would go on and take the children to the gathering. Mrs. Eddy spoke for a few moments, and then she stood in the port cashier of her home, and a sort of an informal receiving line was formed. Now, as the people filed through, they're moving pretty quickly, but the little boy and the little girl got up to Mrs. Eddy, and they just stopped. The whole line stopped while these two little ones stood beaming up at her, and she was beaming back down at them. Finally, it was time for them to move along. She just threw them a little kiss, and on they went. This is what the mother wrote about her experience at that moment. She says, I wish I could make the world know what I saw when Mrs. Eddy looked at those children. It was a revelation to me. I saw for the first time the real mother love. And I knew that I did not have it. As I turned in the procession and walked toward the line of trees in the front of the yard, there was a bird sitting on a limb of a tree, and I saw the same love poured out on that bird that I had seen flow from Mrs. Eddy to my children. I looked down at the grass and the flowers, and there was the same love resting on them. It is difficult for me to put into words what I saw. This love was everywhere, but it was not mere human affection. I looked at the people milling around on the lawn, and I saw it poured out on them. I thought of the various discords in this field 
and I saw for the first time the absolute unreality of everything but this love. It was not only everywhere present, like the light, but it was an intelligent presence <laughs> that spoke to me. And I found myself weeping as I walked back and forth under the trees, saying out loud, Why did I never know you before? Why have I not known you always? On the carriage ride back to the hotel, the mother said that the same consciousness and love was everywhere. It rested on everything that her thought rested upon. <coughs> when they got back to the hotel, there was no boil on the little girl's head. I think about that healing often. What did Mary Baker <laughs> Eddy see when she looked into that little girl's face? And what did she see in the thought of the mother? And how has that thought changed? And could you and I see that same intelligent presence of love <coughs> everywhere? And, and how would that change us? as parents, as teachers, as advocates for children all over the world. You know, through the years, as I have been praying for children, both the world's children and my own, a few basic guidelines have emerged that have helped me so much to be faithful and obedient in these prayers. And I want to share them with you because it is my dearest hope that when you leave today, you're going to take this up. You're going to go home and put away five minutes a day to pray for the children of the world. So I would love to walk you through just a few of these guidelines. And the first one we've really already discussed. The first guideline is recognize one infinite Father, Mother, God. Our Father, Mother, God, all harmonies. The more we feel that pure, infinite, unfailing love protecting and supporting and encouraging us, the more we'll be able to see that same impartial love embracing all the children of the world. We will see that no one is left out. No one is fragile or vulnerable. Each one is complete. And that takes me to guideline number two. Honor their completeness. Refuse to think of them in terms of lack. You know, it's, it's so easy to think about our little folks as kind of walking down a timeline and establishing their relationship with God as they go. But the truth is they are eternally related to God. And so they are eternally complete. And we want to start with that completeness when we are thinking about it. When we were in the process of adopting our first child, we went through a waiting period while all of his papers went through immigration and naturalization services. That took about three months. During that time, we only had two little tiny pictures of him and a very brief description of his history. It was about three paragraphs. When those pictures arrived, you cannot imagine how overwhelmed we were with love for this child. Of course, we've been loving him all along, ever since we started praying about this. We had been recognizing his relationship to his father, mother, God. We'd been cherishing the qualities that we knew he included. But now, he had a face, and he had a name. And our prayers just went so much deeper, and they were more consistent after we looked at that little picture every morning. One of the things that helped me so much in our prayers was a definition of children. You may all know, I'm not sure, that in the back of Science and Health, there's a glossary. 
And it has wonderful spiritual definitions of scriptural terms. So we started out with the definition of children, which begins, the spiritual thoughts and representatives of life, truth, and love. Isn't that a wonderful way to think about children? It's so free. It's so liberating. It tells us who they really are. Later on in that same definition, there was one little phrase that really caught my attention. And it said, not in embryo, but in maturity. What a concept. Not in embryo, but in maturity. As I looked at the pictures of that sweet little guy sitting up in his little high chair, I could see that he included all the fullness of God's might and intelligence and love. Another thing that was so helpful to us was a question and answer. It's on page 475 in Science and Health. And the question is, what is man? Now, my husband and I would plug our son's name right into it. Every day we read this and we said, what is Jamie? And then we would go through the answer and see how each part of that answer applied specifically to this little boy. My favorite part of that answer says, he is the compound idea of God, including all right ideas. Think of that. Every child of God, including you and me, is the compound idea of God, including all right ideas. They are always present. They are always available. They belong to every single one of us. We can't be cut off from our relationship to those right ideas. And you know we saw that when Jamie arrived. He just had, he was just a baby, but he had the most wonderful sense of wisdom and maturity and wholeness. That it always surprised us. It always delighted us. This was so clear to me that I thought I could never forget. But I forgot. I forgot when he was about three years old. Have you ever had this experience? Sometimes we fall into thinking that good is something that's out there. We think it's in people and things and circumstances. And when we start thinking about good as out there, then we think we have to go and get it and bring it to our children. Have you ever had that experience? Well, I was feeling that when Jamie was about three for these reasons. We were living in a condominium that was a second story condominium. We had no yard at all. There were no children in our neighborhood. He was the only child. We were trying so hard to adopt another child, but it seemed that everywhere we went, there was just a brick wall. And we had found a wonderful preschool for Jamie, but it was very expensive. We couldn't begin to afford the tuition. So I was feeling like a complete failure as a parent. One day, I was praying about this when an inspiration from God came to me so clearly that the feeling I had was as if God was shouting at me. And, and this is what I heard. Don't you dare. And I went, Don't you dare what? And just as clearly, I heard, Don't you dare think of this child in terms of lack. At that moment, I realized that I had been unwittingly breaking one of the Ten Commandments. I had been bearing false witness against my neighbor because I was thinking of Jamie as a little empty vessel that I had to fill. So I went back to the prayer that we had done for him before he arrived. I began to rejoice once again that he was not in embryo but in maturity, and that he was the compound idea of God, including all right ideas. And instead of feeling sorry for him, I began to be grateful for all the good that I knew he already included. And the walls began to tumble down. 
First, we were able to pay the tuition for his preschool in a way that we never could have planned. Only God could have done it. Next, two little girls moved into our building. After that, the weather began to get warm, and we realized that even though we didn't have a yard, we had a wonderful swimming pool area that was ours alone during the day because all the grown-ups had gone off to work. So we had little friends over almost every day for swimming parties. But here's the best one. In a matter of months, his little sister was in our home. All of the obstructions to our adoption just dissolved. It was as if we were seeing once again how good our Father Mother God was. Our Father Mother God, all harmonious, was bringing our family together in the way that would best support and uplift good in each of our experiences. Once again, we learned that Spirit God gathers unformed thoughts into their proper channels and unfolds these thoughts, even as he opens the petals of a holy purpose in order that the purpose may appear. And here's the good news. It's that same Father, Mother, God that is bringing together your family and holding you together in these sweet bonds of love and mutual support. And it's God that holds you together and enables you to help one another and be good, true witnesses to one another. Christ Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, they are mine, in the midst of them. When we are gathered together in the name, in the nature of Christ, the Christ remains in our midst, healing us, purifying us, redeeming us. And that kind of acknowledgement of the Christ in our midst keeps us stable and joyful even when things get rough. And you know, sometimes they do get a little rough. And I want to share with you another guideline about something that happened to us in one of those kind of rocky times. Now, this guideline is don't fight stubborn will with more stubborn will. <laughs> It was our daughter Katie who taught me about this one. When Katie arrived, she was one of the most beautiful babies I've ever seen. This is not because I'm her mother. She was just such a lovely little baby that people would stop me on the street whenever I'd go out, and they would just ooh and ah over this darling little girl, and almost inevitably they would end by saying, Oh, you have a beautiful little china doll. And I would think, Mm-hmm. But underneath... She's a Rambo. <laughs> you see, she was such a sweet little girl, and she was so happy, and she was so dear, so long as she got exactly what she wanted. But if she didn't, she could make my life pretty miserable. And I did not want to spend my life butting heads with my daughter. So I began to pray every day about how to be a better parent. Now, there's another poem by Mary Baker Eddy that you may know. It's called Feed My Sheep. And it begins with the words, Shepherd, show me how to go or the hillside steep. And I would take that poem and I would sort of put it in my own words. Shepherd, show me how to be a better parent. Even if it's a steep, rocky, hard pond, I want to go up higher in my understanding of both of my children. And the shepherd did show me how to go and how to grow when Katie was ready for preschool. At that time, her outfit of choice was a little pair of black lycra bike pants and a t-shirt. And she wore them everywhere, to school, to sports, to parties, to church. 
even when we had a fancy little tea party for her fourth birthday and the little girls came with little dresses and hats and gloves, Katie wore black bike pants and pearls. <laughs> there was no getting her to wear anything else. It was just like a brick wall. So I began to ask my shepherd to show me how to go to show me what I needed to know about this little girl to lift this off of her and off of me. One day when I was praying, a very simple thought came to me, and it was this. It was that she was not born of the will of the flesh. So she wasn't programmed to act out the will of the flesh. She was born of God. So the most natural thing in the world was for her to obey God. It was, it was natural. It was joyful. I could see that this was not a willful little mortal who was working out her sense of identity as she worked her way along a timeline. I could see that she was God's immortal idea because her identity was intact and it was spiritual. So, the next time we stood in the closet having our usual discussion about what to wear to church, I didn't argue. I prayed. And as we stood there, I was silently declaring, she is not a willful little mortal. She is not a willful little mortal. And then the most astonishing thing happened. Our shepherd spoke to me. And this is what the shepherd said to me. And you are not a willful big mortal. <laughs> <laughs> I was completely humble. <laughs> and right away, the next verse of that poem flashed into my thought. And that verse begins with the words, Thou wilt bind the stubborn will. And I saw it. I had been trying to bind stubborn will with more stubborn will. It doesn't work, does it? It's the shepherd who binds the stubborn will. And how does the shepherd bind stubborn will? With steadfast love. Did Katie stop wearing black bike pants right away? No. But she did begin to be open to some other options. And as for me... I began to see the practicality of black bike pants for a little budding gymnast who actually spent more time upside down than right side up. It was as if we were both being guided by the same infinite mind. Eventually, she didn't grow out of those black bike pants. And the interesting thing is she developed the most wonderful sense of style now she's the one who gives me all the fashion tips. The shepherd is still guiding us both. And when the shepherd guides us, the result is that which is joyful and progressive for everyone. And that's what we want. Earlier, we talked about Mary and Joseph as role models for parenting. And you remember we mentioned that Mary and Joseph had to be willing to learn from their children. And that, for me, is the next guideline. Be willing to learn from children, not just your own. Be willing to learn from children everywhere. They have so much to teach us. If we'll just step away from the teacher role and be willing to be taught. It was Jamie who taught me to take my prayers up higher. This was when Jamie was about eight years old. We had gone out to dinner one night with a bunch of church friends, and we, um, I was sitting across from him. And looking across, I saw a very rare occurrence. Jamie was not eating. He usually ate like a horse. He was kind of pale and listless, and in a few minutes he said, could I just go in the living room and lie down a little bit? And again, that was very uncharacteristic. So I followed him in. And when I leaned down to hug him and see what was going on, I realized he had a very high fever and he was having chills. So we excused ourselves and got him bundled up and headed for home. We were singing hymns, we were praying, 
all the way. Now, I want to say here that we had every expectation that he would have a quick, decisive healing because we had turned to Christian science for every problem that our children had had, whether they were health problems, school problems, and each time they had had a very quick, complete healing. We hadn't had to go back and return to the problem again. So we had every expectation that he would be healed quickly. When we got home, I got him into his bed and went into his room to talk to him a little bit. Now, in his Sunday school class, they had been learning about finding the spiritual counterfeit. And by this, I mean that they were learning to take any discordant situation and pick out what the material senses were presenting, flip it around, and know what God was seeing and what God was knowing. So, knowing that this is what he'd been working on in Sunday school, he said, Jimmy, what is this bothering you tonight? And he said, oh, Mom, I am so hot, and then I'm so cold. And I said, well, honey, can you tell me the spiritual account of that? Now, I have to tell you here, I was already a step ahead of him. I had already thought about the spiritual account of that, and I was thinking in terms of the three bears. Not too hot, not too cold, just right. But Jamie was way ahead of me. He was very quiet for a few moments. And then he said to me, I'm not in manner to be hot or cold. It took my breath away. He had so gone to the heart of the matter that I knew that that child was healed. I knew he was free. And so I said, sweetie, you just think about that for a little while. I'm going to go into my bedroom and think about that, and I'll come back and check on you. So I went to my room, and I simply saw that he wasn't in matter to be hot or cold, to be sick or well. He was God's spiritual idea only. And when I went back 15 or 20 minutes later, he was as cool as a cucumber. He was fast asleep. The next morning, he woke up. He was running around with his little buddies. There wasn't even a trace of the illness, and there never was again. You know, he did not need me to be a medium or an interpreter to kind of connect him up to God and tell him what he needed to know. God spoke to him directly so he could teach me. There's a sentence in Science and Health that sums this all up to me. It says, the intercommunication is always from God to his idea man. Not from God to big man to little man, but pure and clear from God to his idea man. We can trust God. That takes me to the next guideline. And that one is, take them off the timeline. Refuse to see states and stages. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. He was so aware of his eternal relationship to his father, mother, God, all harmonious that all of the constraints of time had no hold on him. You can't imagine a two-year-old Jesus having a tantrum, can you? <laughs> and you can't imagine a teenage Jesus being all sullen and rebellious. When he was 12, he went to the temple. He spoke to the priests and the rabbis. Do you think they had to talk down to him? Mary Baker Eddy says in Science and Health, Man in science is neither young nor old. He has neither birth nor death. Now think about that. If we have neither birth nor death, then we don't have all those little stages that we have to go through between birth and death. So what do we have instead? We have wholeness. We have completeness. We have immortality. How often do we think of our children in that light? How often do we think of ourselves 
in that light. You know, when we had that healing, when God spoke to me and said, don't you dare think of him in terms of lack. Again, I thought, I can never forget this. This has changed my life. But I forgot again. And when do you think that was? When he was a teenager. At that time, we had moved to a different part of the country. And the move was really rough on all of us. But it was particularly rough on Jamie. He was in high school. He had lost all of his friends. There was just a very different way of living there. And I looked at that boy and I thought I saw all kinds of lack. I saw lack of focus, lack of discipline, lack of friends, lack of joy. And most of all, I saw a stunning lack of love and respect for his parents. He had always been such a good boy. And then all of a sudden, it was like he was trying to get himself in trouble. He had been a good student. And all of a sudden, he was trying to fail. He went to a high school where there was a huge emphasis on all of the, the graduates going to a four-year college. So in about the middle of 10th grade, we had this big meeting. And you went to this place where they had all these posters up of the different universities in our area. And it, each poster had the requirements for getting into that university. And it would be grade point, SAT scores, essays, extracurricular activities, references from teachers. And I can remember leaving that meeting so overwhelmed. I knew we were in trouble. What was going to happen to our boy if he didn't wake up? Well, within weeks, I got a call from a Spanish teacher. And Spanish, or a foreign language, was one of the requirements for going to a good university. And so the Spanish teacher called and said to me, well, he was on the verge of failing. I thought I might pass him. But at the end of exam time, he had marched up to the front of the room, ripped up his exam, and very ceremoniously thrown it in the trash right in front of her. She had to fail him. I was so upset. I was angry. I was frustrated. I was afraid. And so I called a Christian science practitioner. Now, just in case you don't know what a Christian science practitioner is, that's someone who gives his or her full time to a ministry of Christian healing. And anyone of any faith can call on a Christian science practitioner with a problem that you might be having, and we'll pray together to find a spiritual solution to that problem. So in my deep despair about my son, I, I called a friend who was a Christian science practitioner, and I told her all of my sad story. And she said, Julie, do you know what's wrong with you? <laughs> You're seeing that boy on a timeline, and it looks like this. If he does well in high school, he'll get to go to a good college. And if he goes, does well in college, he'll go to a good graduate school. If he goes, does a good graduate school, then you'll have a nice job, and one day out here somewhere, there'll be a home and a family, maybe. That was exactly what I thought. But then she said to me very vehemently, he already includes his education. He already includes his career. He already includes his family now. I saw exactly what she meant. I knew for the first time that there were no contingencies in God's plan for his child. There were no detours. There were no failures. He could not sabotage his own spiritual identity. He couldn't undo what God had already done. And so I began to worry about him less and pray for him more. And again, I was grateful for all the good that I knew he already included. And the most surprising thing happened. Even though he didn't do very well in school, even though he did fail Spanish, he got into a wonderful university. And he had an amazing experience there. We still can't figure out how that happened. Only God could have done that. 
Because just as we knew before we ever met him, he is the compound idea of God, including all right ideas. And every child of God is the compound idea of God, including all right ideas. They're always present. They're always available. Each one has his or her own specific spiritual purpose, and that includes no detours. It includes nothing that can be put on hold. It includes nothing that can be hidden. Because all good is right here, right now. We can't escape from infinite good, the outpouring of infinite good. And that brings me to the very last point, which, like the first one, kind of sums it all up. Fear not. They can't get outside of God. In this age of helicopter parents, we've sort of begun to equate love for our children with fear for our children. And and that seems like a pretty justifiable thing right now because the world seems like a much more dangerous place today than it was when you and I were growing up. And we all have a decision to make. Are we going to spend our time fending off one evil and then another and then another? Or are we going to lift up the omnipotence of God? When our children were growing up, from the time they were tiny babies until they went off to college, I left their room every night with one sentence from Science and Health. God is everywhere, and nothing apart from Him is present or has power. That's so important, I want to say it again. God is everywhere, and nothing apart from Him is present or has power. I felt that if they only knew that one sentence, it would take them through any challenge they ever had to meet. Because God is everywhere, they couldn't get outside of God. They couldn't run away from Him. They couldn't be taken away from Him. Wherever they went, God, infinite love, would already be there. And love is the only power. There's nothing to oppose love. There's nothing that can hold out against that universal solvent of love. And there are no danger zones in the omnipresence of love. I learned this when Jamie was sent to Afghanistan during his military deployment. He was there for 14 months. And during that time, sometimes I would just be overwhelmed with fear for him. Sometimes I'd wake up in the middle of the night shaking. And sometimes I'd be driving the car and I'd have to pull the car over to the side and cry for a little while. But before he left, his dad had made a suggestion, and it was this. When any member of the family became afraid, we would meet in the 91st Psalm. Now, by this we meant that any time we were overwhelmed with fear, we would turn to the promises of the 91st Psalm and actively claim them, not just for our child, but for all children, everything. And we did. We turned to it day in and day out. One thing that helped me was looking up the 91st Psalm in different translations of the Bible. And this is just a short passage that has helped me so much. And this is from the message, which is a contemporary paraphrase of the Bible that was written by Eugene Peterson. I'll just read you verses 3 through 5. He rescues you from hidden, hidden traps, shields you, from deadly hazards. His huge, outstretched arm protects you. Under them you're perfectly safe. His arms fend off all harm. Fear nothing. 
Not wild wolves in the night, nor flying arrows in the day, nor disease that prowls through the darkness, nor disaster that erupts at high noon. Fear nothing. Their Father, Mother God, all harmonious, the God who loves to love them, is already with them, protecting them, healing them guiding them. Fear nothing. They cannot get outside of God. Now I want to read you a poem that helped me so much during that time, but actually it has helped me since the day the children arrived, and I think you may love it too. It's, it's a poem that was originally in the Christian Science Journal, and it was written by Holly Suey. It's called only a lamb. In a dream that seemed so real, I heard my child calling to me to save him. Frantic, and with all my strength, I rushed to the scene, finding him already beyond my reach. My heart cried out to my God and his. It was then I awoke to hear Christ speak. God, Love is like a shepherd who carries his lambs in his arms all the day long and all the night long and never puts one down and never lets one down. My dear lamb, God said to me, I have never asked you to be the shepherd. Both lambs were saved. We have never been asked to be the shepherd. We are asked to be God's precious, tender, obedient lambs. Lambs who trust their shepherd completely and follow him consistently. Can we do that? Yes. Now, i just like to take just a few more minutes to walk you back through those basic guidelines so that you take them home with you and, and utilize them. Use them in your prayers for your own children and your prayers for the children of the world. Now you'll remember that the great big headline for this talk is that line from Science and Health. Our Father, Mother, God, all harmonious. And that's so important that I'd love for us to say it together. So on the count of three. One, two, three. And Our Father, Father, Mother, God, all harmonious. And when we recognize that Father, Mother, God, all harmonious, we've already been obedient to the first guideline. Recognize one infinite Father, Mother, God. Recognizing that one infinite source helps us to be obedient to the second God. Honor their completeness. Refuse to think of them in terms of lack. Honoring their completeness will help us to realize that the child is God's creation. We don't have to form that child in our own image and likeness. And that way we will know that we don't have to fight human will with more human will. Remember the little black bike pants. Also, honoring their completeness enables us to be humble and willing and to learn from our children. So there's another guideline. Be willing to learn from children. Just as I was able to learn from Jamie when he taught me that we aren't in matter to be hot or cold. When we know this, knowing that God speaks to them directly, and that that intercommunication is always from God to his ideal man, then we'll be obedient to the next one. Take them off the timeline. 
refuse to see states and stages. We know that they are eternally related to their father, mother, God. And so they have all they need, moment by moment. They'll never lose an opportunity for good. And that takes us to the final guideline, which is fear not. They can't get outside of God. And here's the good news. You can't get outside of God either. You will never be outside of those everlasting arms of love. You are cared for. You are watched over. You are beloved. You are protected. Just as our poem said, you have never been asked to be the shepherd. You are God's innocent, precious lamb. That lamb who he carries in his bosom all the day long and all the night long. And when we know that, both lambs are saved. Thank you so much. Help yourself to wonderful literature that we have at the back, and also goodies at the back. So let's let's meet each other for a little while. <laughs> Thanks so much.